Hey, Matthew. Hey, Connor. Um, will you be Umze today? I will be Umze today. All right. Would you like me to, pre to present or can you do that? Uh, I'd appreciate it if you would. I don't think I ever downloaded the thing you sent me. Okay. Actually, that's not true. I do have it, but could you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Serge. Hi, Jacqueline. I, I presume it's Jacqueline. Jack, Jack yes. <laughs> yes, it does come from Jacqueline. I was yeah. with it, Jack. Yes, yeah. Uh, this is not a shortcut. It's what? It's not a shortcut. Right. <laughs> Maybe Cyril will come, but I am not sure. Okay, great. Glad you're here. He's with a friend. Maybe he will. He would be just somewhat late. I don't know. If he comes. Yeah. Hi, Jack. <laughs> good, good. Hi, Sue. Hi, Ed. Hi. We, we have my helper here for technology so we can do this. Good, good. <laughs> what happens? I don't know. Well, I just disappeared. You're still here. But I, I have a you. funny thing on my screen that says join a live Zoom. Oh, just. Hmm. How do I get rid of it? We neither one of us seem to know. Just close it up there at the, Where? the bottom, the bottom of the black X. I don't see a black egg. Wait a minute. First of all, I can't even shut my mic off. Oh, shit. Host attendee Zoom. No. On the bottom, click down to the bottom where it says Zoom. Huh? Let me have it. Can't even turn off the mic. Awesome. Doug, I love your cat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was an unexpected appearance. <laughs> there it comes. Right. Now, how do we? So you're not going to mute. No, it keeps doing that. Guys, I keep getting a. <laughs> now you're muted, Sue. Yeah. We can hear everything until you uh, were asking a question. I'm going to call her, guys. Now shut off our camera for oh. all right. Okay, so it is 11 o'clock. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started with prayers. So I'm going to present and Matthew's going to read them. Um, unless there's any initial um, announcements that we want to do right away.
maybe just if people who do feel comfortable putting on their videos, please do, because I love to see, you know, people's reactions. It helps. Oh, yeah, that'd be great if everyone wants to turn on their videos, um, please do. Um, and but also no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and present and mute myself during that process. So, Matthew, you're up. Um, Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, Endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, Ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector. 
to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the golden moon, a stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning. To the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freeding, freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms and all aspects with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niratiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Ridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on a massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. 
Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra. Likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra. Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell on the perfection of wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhists who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Dayate, gate, gate, peregate, perasam gate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharidevaputra, the Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so Jack is going to be giving the talk, so I'm going to hand it over to them. Everybody. Thank you, Matthew and Connor. Um, this is kind of nice. It's like a small group today. Um, I'm guessing that's partly because of Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Um, and yeah, if you do feel comfortable turning on your video, that's awesome. I love seeing your faces, uh, but also no pressure whatsoever. Um, so I'm a refuge student of uh, Lama Jimpa, and I have been since March of 2021, or it's 2021 this year, March of 2019. <laughs> um, and I'm doing a talk today on the role of hierarchy within Tibetan Buddhism and also within our lives. And I was, you know, as usual, I kind of pick a topic that's like, this like massive thing. And like, I wanna talk about everything. Um, and turns out there's way too much to talk about. So I think what's gonna happen is that I'll probably end up doing like a part two. 
And in that part too, I wanna to talk about like the, the various ways in which hierarchy can play kind of a negative role within our personal lives. And so that might be things based off of like um, race, gender identity, sexuality, and so forth, and how those can be kind of um, limitations to connecting with others when they're put in that kind of hierarchical way. So some sources for today's um, talk, uh, I have Darshan, which is like a personal meeting with, uh, with Lama Jempa. And then also, this is a really awesome book, How to Relate to a Spiritual Teacher by Alexander Berzin. It's really helpful if, um, if you're interested in meeting with a guru, having a teacher, um, it kind of breaks down the ways that Westerners get into really complicated situations with their gurus and kind of how can we get to a healthier relationship. Also, Buddha nature, the Uttara Tantra Shastra that a lot of us are reading for the Buddha Dharma program. Um, and those were kind of the main two. And then as well as um, the heart of the path, seeing the guru as Buddha by Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Um, and Shambhala, The Sacred Path of the Warrior by Troyam Trungpa Rinpoche. Those were kind of also um, some resources for me. And today I'll be kind of painting with a broad brush. So if there's like things that don't necessarily seem to match or ways that it, things don't fit within your life, that's okay. Um, I'm kind of doing like some broad generalizations, but also talking about my own lived experience um, of various like, hierarchies that, that I've experienced, as well as the ways that that um, positioned me to receive the Dharma in a way that initially might not have been so helpful. So there's many ways that like a hierarchical structure can play a role within Buddhism from the roles of like Geshe's and Lamas um, to within the teachings themselves. So there's like developmental stages within the teachings. Um, and these are kind of like natural and like, again, like developmental hierarchies that are in the role of kind of like a educational model. Um, and this is a very different way uh, that hierarchy plays a role um, from what I've experienced within the culture that, that I'm in. So I'll talk a little bit about why Westerners can often have difficulties encountering hierarchy within Buddhism due to the culture that we're in. So I kind of like to imagine like natural hierarchies a, a little bit like, more like an ecosystem. So I was actually out, um, I was with my partner out at the um, Nisqually River the other day. And if any of you are familiar with, um, with Mount Rainier, you know, this glorious mountain um, and Actually, in the indigenous language, it's uh, Mount Tacoma. And Tacoma means the mother of all waters. And I thought that's this, this really beautiful word for, for this incredible mountain. So, you know, the, the glaciers and all the, uh, you know, the snowpack is the mother of all this incredible water that comes down from the mountain. And through that, you know, there's all these different ecosystems that the mountain supports. And so I kind of like to think of, um, of like the, the Buddha Dharma and the teachings and the different um, levels of, of teachers, um, as well as ourselves, the students, as this kind of ecosystem that's working together rather than um, like a top-down approach of being kind of like told what to do. So um, I thought that it was kind of nice that uh, the mother of all waters that, that I'd be mentioning that today on Mother's Day. And we can kind of think of it as, you know, we are not our mothers, but we wouldn't exist without our mothers. And so in the same way that a river would not exist without the mountain, we're all in this kind of interdependent ecosystem together. So this is one way that we can kind of visualize and understand the hierarchies within, um, within the mandala um, and within Shambhala. So this is the enlightened community that we're trying to create as a Sangha. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about myself um, and how my misunderstandings around hierarchy um, and the culture that I'm, I'm in, as well as my response to that culture, kind of skewed my perception of hierarchy when I came to the Dharma. 
So we'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about that in part two of this talk, which will not be happening today, um, but I'll do a, a little bit today. Um, so for the last, I don't know, gosh, decade or two decades even, I've really kind of identified with anti-authoritarianism anti in like all its forms. Um, and I think there's like a lot of pros to that. Um, and I was really fascinated and I am, still am fascinated with this idea that we can have a society in which there are no hierarchies that divide us, where society functions um, in a way that supports people's lives in the very like different and unique ways that we want to live them. And so there's, I imagine this kind of proliferation of philosophical, spiritual, and creative growth, rather than growth merely for the purpose of profit, um, which just you know places wealth in the hands of a, of a few. So, in this kind of ideal world, um, the distribution of resources and wealth does not depend on your race, your gender, nationality, sexuality, and so forth. So, kind of you know, imagine a society like that. And turns out what I was imagining was this kind of enlightened society of Shambhala. And so it was really a, a surprise to kind of discover um, this idea of Shambhala, this society. Um, and, and what's different is that there are those kind of natural hierarchies because it is a kingdom. Um, but what's so different about this notion of hierarchy is that each individual has a role within the mandala every role is important to the function of that, of that society. Um, and you know, in the world that we have today, we see so frequently how little human and other life is valued when the focus of that society is profit. So right now we kind of see a hierarchy that's based on financial wealth and that wealth as one gets wealthier and wealthier. Um, functions through the exploitation of people, of poorer countries, and of the natural world. So I don't like this type of hierarchy. <laughs> I don't like it at all. And um, it's not the hierarchy of Shambhala. So I was raised in the West, obviously, in America, Southern California. Um, I grew up in a Christian household. I went to a Christian school from pre-K to eighth grade. Um, I have really wonderful parents, but they too were kind of, you know, raised in this very Christian or Catholic um, environment. And my mom was very much like, you know, submission to authority. This is very, very important to behave in that way. While my dad was very much like he rebelled against Catholicism, doesn't want anything to do with it. Um, but still kind of, you know, says he believes in Jesus and all that. And so there's these kind of currents in my life of submission to authority, yet rebelling against authority. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of great things that I learned within Christianity. You know, I don't want to knock it or throw it away. You know, um, I learned that there was something bigger than myself outside of myself. I also learned that there was like this enormous capacity for, for love and compassion and that I could be of service to my community. So those were really important things that I learned. However, um, I came to kind of see how different aspects of Christian doctrines could be easily manipulated to function as a force of oppression. Um, along with, you know, there's, there's also this, this force for good that, you know, the teachings of, of Jesus um, taught. But over, the, over time, the church became such a powerful force. And I think this might have something to do with the element with Chris, within Christianity that kind of demands its followers to have blind faith. So this very top-down approach of, you know, God is going to save us. Um, and, you know, we have to kind of just follow what he says. And so what I found was that in this kind of approach, my own inquiry usually came up against the wall of, well, it's God's purpose. Um, and 
everything had a reason and that reason was kind of dictated by God. Um, so I think this kind of role of God as the total source of our redemption, um, it can easily be manipulated um, to induce this kind of sense of submission without investigation um, or even like acceptance of unjust situations because, you know, Jesus will take the wheel. Um, so it lends this kind of like passivity in its followers. And I think that can be easily manipulated um, by powerful for forces. So we see like the Crusades for one, or, um, you know, even the governments behind recent wars. So there are a few ways that the Buddhist approach feels very different. <laughs> one of them is that we don't get into wars with people <laughs> based off of our differences. That's that's a really big one. Um, and also the Buddha really encouraged his disciples to investigate for themselves whether his teachings were true or not, whether they made sense and to not follow by blind faith. So there's this like kind of current within Buddhism of personal investigation of the Dharma within your own experience and to not just accept things because the Buddha said or because your teacher said. Um, and there's also, you know, this figure of the Buddha himself, you know, he was raised in opulence. He was the prince of a kingdom. And so kind of the top of the top when it comes to social hierarchy. And so along with like incredible wealth, he had all these kind of sensual pleasures available to him. He had a fantastic repu reputation because he was like the top of the class in all of like the, his forms of study and he received a ton of praise. So as far as the eight worldly concerns go, he was like top of the hierarchy, right? He had everything that he could ever wanted. But what happens when he decides, okay, I'm gonna leave the palace walls, you know, these kind of very sheltered, enclosure that tries to keep out filth, aging, illness, all of this. He encounters all of those things and he realizes that none of us are immune to any of the troubles of samsara. That, you know, no matter where you are in the social hierarchies, that doesn't matter. All of that is empty and totally made up. Um, and we're all going to face death. We're all going to face illness. So, he developed this renunciation for, for the eight worldly concerns um, that put us in this mindset of getting the most, getting the best, being the most praised, having the best reputation, et cetera. Um, so in some ways, you know, rejecting those social hierarchies that, that often dictate our lives and are completely you know, empty of anything lasting um, or anything permanent or truly satisfying, um, is, is really, you know, like this first step that the Buddha made. Um, and another realization that he had, along with that, okay, everyone experiences the same thing. It's kind of this flattening aspect of the hierarchies. Um, another realization that he had was that there is a path out of all this suffering. Um, and it turns out that we all have Buddha nature. And we have the capacity to liberate ourselves and others from this suffering. So I think, you know, we look at the figures of the Buddha, we look at the figures of Jesus, some of their teachings are very similar. Um, but when you kind of remove that all powerful God and replace instead encourage personal investigation and acknowledge the inherent uh, like radiant capacity of all sentient beings, this really changes things. So it turns out we have everything we need to liberate ourselves and it doesn't come from a God. It doesn't come from outside of ourselves. It comes from, from us. Um, so this shift from like the kind of top down approach to a bottom up approach, that was really refreshing for me. So, as Westerners though, we do have this kind of tendency. Um, we have a, like a paradoxical relationship with hierarchy that I think can um, be confusing once we get into Buddhism and get into like a relationship with a teacher. So on the one hand, in the United States, 
were so obsessed with the idea of personal freedom. So I have a right to do what I want when I want it. And that is what freedom means. So we see in like the case of, you know, like anti-maskers, anti, you know, anti-vaxxers, this kind of idea of, well, it's my right. I don't want to wear a mask. And uh, it doesn't matter that you all are at risk. So is that, you know, is that really freedom? Um, and on the other hand, we are told that, you know, to be patriotic, we must have like kind of supreme reverence um, for the symbols of this nation, you know, like the president or even the flag, you know. Um, and also, unfortunately, our, our school system at the moment too, um, our, our general kind of K through 12 is, is very much geared towards compliance and learning towards the test. That's really kind of shifted into that, you know, teaching towards a test. And so there's kind of this, um, you know, setting us up towards compliance and, um, and not exactly thinking critically. So if there's this interesting paradox between like personal freedom and, you know, submission to authority. And of course, you know, we fall on a spectrum. So with this mind, um, one raised in both like Christianity and Americanism, I rebelled against both of those. And then I shifted into a mind that was, you know, the opposite. I want to completely subvert all hierarchies and, um, and all authority. And so then I got into that kind of rigid uh, mind of, of total anti-authoritarianism. So we kind of see this idea of not too tight and not too loose. We don't want to get rigid in any of, of these mindsets. So I'm kind of surprised that I even made it inside the door of the temple, to be honest, <laughs> because I, I really don't know how I got there. I think it was like good karma. Um, and so when I first, you know, went to the temple and, you know, we opened the prayer books and we say the prayers, there's some prayers in there that I was like, I don't know, I, I do not like this. <laughs> like, you know, there's language of like supreme one, uh, you know, chief of humans, supreme protector. And of course, I'm coming to that language with this mindset of, um, you know, social justice, uh, subverting hierarchy. And uh, it's really not the type of mind that makes sense to apply within this context. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. And fortunately, I really only juggled with that for for a bit and eventually I kind of shifted it into, I'm gonna take this as a challenge. Can I read these prayers and can I be engaged in this type of practice while also you know, still maintaining my wish for, for social justice? Can I see these prayers as a way of kind of breaking down my attachment to the self and breaking down, uh, I don't know, this really like intense uh, feeling of like, individuality and, uh, and whatnot. So I think that's a really important point um, that we can, you know, we can be very like humble disciples while at the same time having, um, you know, being an empowered individual self. It's kind of this dialectical relationship there. So it leads me to this point of the, of the guru disciple relationship. And so here we have this uh, idea of, you know, this person is, uh, has more information than me, they have more experience and they're, they're my teacher. And so they're put in this kind of, you know, hierarchical position, higher than me. And I approach this relationship with a lot of hesitation uh, because of my, my background. And mom actually told me that that's really good. We don't wanna just jump right in because then we're kind of at risk of a whole host of, of problems. Um, and so I think this is actually really good that I kind of like tested the waters. <laughs> Lama even the other day, he, he kind of said that it's, it's almost like we're wild animals and we have to see like, can we like 
can we be nice to each other? Can we be in this relationship together? Um, and, and can it work? So, um, you know, we have to be careful because the guru is someone who has so much power. And so we have to be meeting with someone that we really trust and, um, and someone who has a lot of experience in what they're doing. And I think a lot of times what happens in the West is that we don't investigate too closely um, who our teachers are. And so sometimes this happens where there are abuses of power within guru and student relationships. And of course, sometimes these are the stories that stick out the most because they have like a shocking quality. Um, and so I think they're actually a, a, a lot more rare than what usually happens, which is like a really beautiful and powerful relationship. So yeah, I'm kind of scrolling through my notes here. If the, you know, if these abuses can kind of happen if the, the relationship veers from the goal, which is to support the student in gaining realizations on the path and recognizing their true nature. So it's a very sensitive relationship. Um, and when not paired with ethical conduct, that hierarchical relationship can be very damaging. So I think when I met Lama, what really put me at ease is that I knew that he had an emphasis on and personal commitment to his own ethical conduct and following precepts. And so that really helped me um, because it allowed me to feel at ease. And he was practicing what he, what he preaches. So I think that's really important. So what are some other ways that, that Westerners can sometimes go off in the wrong direction? Um, sometimes we see our teacher as a God. We want them to be, you know, an all powerful God who tells us what to do. Um, sometimes we see them as a parent or a therapist. I know that often happens with Loma because he is a therapist. So that can be kind of, <laughs> kind of complicated. Um, and it's funny, you know, we like want people to tell us what to do, to be like the supreme authority. And yet when they give us a suggestion, oftentimes we're like, nah, no, I got this, I'm good. <laughs> like, you know, so there's this, again, there's that paradoxical relationship within the West of like submitting to the authority of like your nation or whatever, and then having utmost personal freedom. And so we can really get in this, weird kind of dynamic. Um, and I think that puts us at risk too of like trying to do this on our own. Um, and that's where kind of that natural hierarchy comes in again, the educational developmental model. And there's that analogy of like, let's say you have to get an operation done. You gotta get brain surgery you wanna find a doctor to perform this and you wouldn't want like a second year med student to do your brain surgery, right? You want someone who has a depth of hands-on experience and training, someone who's skilled and confident in their abilities. And also, wouldn't it be great if that doctor was also someone who had had their own brain surgery and could kind of like support us and, and show us empathy, like I've been through it, you know? Um, so this is the kind of natural hierarchy that takes place within the, the guru-disciple relationship, one of experience and ability. And yet when it comes to the spiritual path, we turn to all types of like fix-it remedies, um, like get enlightened quick schemes. We're very susceptible to the charlatans and like fortune tellers and all this. So I wonder why we're like still so confused about this, this natural hierarchy we want to be taken care of. We like, we want others to do the work for us and we want to receive the benefits, but we don't actually want to, to put in the work. Um, so that's kind of what the, the disciple relationship is that we have this guide who's letting us know, here's what you need to do. And so that's why we're in this dynamic together so that we can, um, we can actually learn and grow. Um, 
so one thing that I think is very important that that Lama has done is that he's encouraged and, and actually has you know has made it so that if you want to take refuge with him, you have to take the first five precepts. Um, and so we're kind of setting a base foundation of ethical conduct. And this one has been, been really huge for me. And it's kind of taught me about how there isn't anything external to me that can lead me to liberation. For example, I can't take drugs anymore. I used to do a lot of drugs. I used to drink a lot. And I think this is because I was really seeking spiritual realizations. And so I wanted to change my mind. I wanted to, to shift my perception. And I can't do that anymore because I can no longer take intoxicants. That one's been really hard for me because um, I kind of want that get quick, like top of the mountain, you know, take the helicopter to the top of the mountain, do some psychedelics, have a good time. Um, so I've learned that, okay, through my choice to engage in ethical conduct, there's nothing external to me that can bring me liberation. I have to do it with my own abilities. Um, so then that kind of goes back to, okay, if we are doing it with our own ability, why can't I just be a cowboy Buddhist, roughing it on my own, like kind of figuring it out as we go? It's that kind of, you know, like false romantic idea that, um, that I can do it myself. That, that I can seek my own liberation because I have it within me, I have my own capacity. Um, but what I'm coming to recognize through uh, my relationship with my spiritual teacher um, is that his role as a superior is to empower me. And so it's this really beautiful kind of dynamic relationship where I'm recognizing that within this context, I, I, I know next to nothing. And Lama is empowering me to become everything that I am, which is a sentient being who has the ability to become a Buddha. So without trusting that, I would still be kind of wasting my time, just searching for the next cure-all, the next psychedelic trip, the next whatever, you know, just kind of like running my head into the wall, trying to, you know, somehow feel at peace um, with that really kind of tragic pursuit of samsaric happiness. Um, so Lama and, and our spiritual teachers, they don't want us just to find our perfect samsara. Um, they want us to be free. That is the role of the guru disciple relationship. I have to learn how to be free. I don't know how to be free right now. So that relationship, it's not to force us to do anything. It's not to force us to comply. But we are recognizing that, you know, we need to get this knowledge from our teacher because we just, we don't have it yet. And at the same time, on the conventional level, we are our own individual selves with our unique lived experience that influences how we learn and experience the Dharma. So we bring a lot to the table. And it's incredible that we have a teacher who is willing and wanting to learn about our individual lives and guide us kind of based on our unique experience. So I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and it's also really important to know that like, we don't wanna approach this relationship again with this idea of just submitting to authority. Um, we need to examine what we are taught and we also need to bring questions and even like complaints or disagreements respectfully to that relationship. That's really important. So other ways that, that the, the guru relationship is really important is that um, the Dharma is really vast. We can get lost <laughs> in all of this stuff. I'm super lost in all of this stuff. And so Lama is really there to kind of guide us based on our you know, developmental place within the Dharma. And there's, you know, the teachings themselves, you know, such as like the Lam Rim path, that's developmental. It's, it's built to deepen our practice along the path. And then there's, you know, these just different kind of levels of teaching, like the, you know, teaching on how to be 
be a good person, like ethical conduct. And then it gets a little bit more complicated, like bodhisattva and training path. And then we have, you know, ultimate nature of reality. And all of these things are progressively more complicated. And so if we don't have a teacher, it's going to be really confusing. And it could also be really damaging because we could get into like a mindset of like nihilism. Um, sometimes if we approach certain teachings without like a guide. So I kind of think of it too. I love this um, metaphor that Sue actually has brought up before um, of like a, a one room schoolhouse. So we have like K through 12th grade. We're all in this <laughs> like uh, learning process together and we're all in different stages. And so maybe like the, I don't know, like second graders, sometimes I feel like a second grader in the Dharma, maybe a first grader. We might go and visit the 10th grade class and learn about, see some chemistry happening, right? So that's kind of what Lama's doing is that he'll introduce us to something that we're just like, I have no idea. But we're getting some seeds planted so that we're, you know, we're seeing it and we might come across it later and we'll have a different understanding of it. So it's really helpful to have a guide. So I wanna read just a short thing from Lama Zopa Rinpoche on why it's, you know, important if you're gonna, you know, kind of devote yourself to a spiritual practice to have a guru. And it's from his book, um, The Heart of the Path. Directly devoting to the virtuous friend is the root of the path to enlightenment. If we don't know how important it is, nothing can happen. It is the root of all realizations from here up to enlightenment. On the Hinayana path to achieve nirvana, and the Mahayana, Sutra, and Tantra paths to achieve enlightenment. If we correctly follow the virtuous friend with thought and action, if the root is there, we can have success up to enlightenment. Everything depends on this practice, on how much we know of it. Otherwise, we might have done this retreat or that retreat, this practice or that practice, received this teaching or that teaching, this initiation or that initiation, this and this and this and this, but nothing happens in our mind. Our mind is still like an empty container. Maybe we know the Dharma intellectually, but when a problem comes, it looks like we don't know it at all, like we have never learned it. This is why correctly devoting to the spiritual friend is called the root of the path to enlightenment. So I like that just because it kind of shows, you know, um, we totally can try and do this on our own, but what, like why? <laughs> why try and do it on our own when we, can have support and guidance. Um, and I think it allows for a much easier road, less bumps on the road when you have support. So I wanna go back a little bit to that, um, that image of the mountain. So maybe you have a special mountain in your life. I know uh, my special mountain is Mount Rainier. Um, maybe Mount Shasta, you know, just one of these like big mountains that are really kind of like imposing, you know, they're just really uh, fierce kind of presences. Kind of imagine this mountain and bring up that mountain ecosystem to mind. So at the top we can imagine, okay, we have, we have our guru, we have all of our teachers, and maybe there's the teachings of ultimate nature of reality, or the meditation practices of Dogchen or Mahamudra. Then we kind of come down a bit. We hit the alpine line, the forest begins. Maybe we come across the path and, and vows of the bodhisattva, maybe some deity yoga meditations. Further down, we see the creeks and streams leading to the river valley, where we find the flourishing of the sutras, teachings on how to be a good person, how to care for one another, how to live our conventional lives in an ethical way. And maybe the incredibly important practice, foundational practice of shamatha meditation. And we can see when we, when we look at all of this, that we can't really isolate one element from the other. We must take these kind of graduated steps on the path and looking to our teachers for, for inspiration, looking to the top, because that's, that's where we're headed. 
but we're gonna be making kind of circles around the mountain until we get there. And we might even have to come back down to visit, you know, oh yeah, how do I be a good person again? <laughs> so there's all these ways in which um, these different ecosystems work together. And we never totally abandon these developmental views or meditation or action until we are a fully enlightened Buddha, until we're the sky. So we really have to recognize the importance and, and interconnectedness of the entire ecosystem. And that's why we can't disparage ourselves for being on any part of the path. We must feel empowered. We are part of the ecosystem. We are the ecosystem and we have Buddha nature. So I hope that image leaves you feeling empowered and maybe you can visit it. I hope it's helpful. And um, yeah, let's go on to questions, comments and complaints. <laughs> Anybody? Hey, Jackie. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm on my phone, and this is the first time I've done this. So, can you hear me? Okay. You're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you for the talk. Really excellent talk. Um, thank you. It's interesting. The thing on on hierarchy. I remember. Um, well, still, even I'll pick up the text, and of course, you know, language, it's all key, right? right? And I can remember, and I think it was a book on Buddha nature, just to reading the preface, and the translator, I think, is a woman. It, if it wasn't that book, it was another one. And she said, you know, conventionally, um, we always use he as the pronoun. So I hope you don't mind that that's what I'm doing. And <laughs> my first thought was, yeah, I really do mind. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you don't have to do that. Um, uh -huh. But so good that, <laughs> that still bugs me. I mean, it just bugs me, but it's the way, you know. And when you were talking about relating with Lama, yeah, there's there's always, um, and it's becoming less, but there's there's some friction, right? Mm -hmm. With, with, the, with the, the hierarchical, or in my mind, supposed hierarchical, because it probably isn't really hierarchical in the way that I have learned what that word means. Because on an ultimate level, Remember the saying, you know, you get the blessings of the guru when you think of him as a person, or when you think of her as a bodhisattva, or when you think of her as a Buddha, and the blessings mm -hmm. are, okay. So when I am with the teacher, when I'm with Lama, sometimes, and it doesn't happen often, but sometimes there is a shift, and I can see that this is not a solid individual person I'm with, mm. right? So that takes the hierarchy, the hierarchy out of it mm. to, to get beyond the conventional level. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, and, and it doesn't happen often, but every once in a while I'll get that shift. Yeah. And then it's really, it's, it, it's an important shift because it'll stay with me. Right. Yeah. And I think like what happens with me is that I really know that he's trying to pull something out of me or like bring out this, uh, my own like inherent nature, which is the same as his, you know? And so we're all, you know, relating to each other, um, in, in ways that aren't exactly, that aren't true. Right. Because there is that flattening aspect of Buddha nature where it's like, no matter who you are, we, we all have this, this nature. Um, and so I think he's, he's trying to bring that out in all of us, you know, that's the purpose of that relationship. Um, and then, yeah, it's funny. I, I, I was thinking the same thing when I was reading the, um, the preface to Buddha nature, like, just, you know, mix it up a bit. <laughs> but I, I think there was a book in our Buddha Dharma program where, where the, the author or the translator did use both both she and her um so i thought that was pretty cool maybe they'll add they them somewhere down the line that'd be cool too <laughs> um 
I see Ellen has a hand up. Yeah, Jack, thanks for the talk. It's uh, really fascinating. <clears throat> I think I had an observation about something I really loved about your message, and then I had a question. So yeah, one of the things cool. I really loved was your observation that what uh, the guru is doing is actually trying to make a, get bring us to a point where we don't need a guru, or we are the guru, you know, where we're liberated. So I think that in itself is sort of anti-hierarchical, like there's a mm -hmm. hierarchy to begin with, but the goal is to make it so you don't any longer need the person. So I think that's right. just so, so sweet. Uh, my, my question has very little to do with your talk, but you said something early that really in interested me. So I wanted to ask you about it. You sort of defined your idyllic society as, and I'll use a label, it's probably oversimplistic, as one that's more sort of socialistic, you know, where everybody is an equal and gets to share in the resources. I wonder what you think about the fact that those of us in the United States living in this capitalist community, can we all become Buddhas in this economic, Buddhas in this economic mm -hmm. structure? Will it naturally devolve, you know, break down over time? Do we have to make it our job to, you know, to fight <laughs> it? How do you reconcile sort of the relative reality of, the economy we're in with what you would prefer and the path yeah that's a that's like the question of my life ellen <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been working on that one for for a while um yeah i don't know it's i it's really complicated and i think you know I think the Sangha and, and the way, the direction that Lama is going to is in this one where we want to, um, we want to show that we're supporting so, social justice movements. You know, this is really important to kind of name it, to say like, here's what we stand for. Um, and I think that is a world that is, um, you know, is one where, where, where resources are shared, um, where it's not, you know, going to this, small, you know, portion of people at the top. Um, and there's a lot of, that we have to do to work towards that. And so I think at all times, it's, we kind of have to do all things at once, you know, we have to be working on ourselves and we have to be working with the world. Um, you know, it's not, it's not separate. And, um, yeah, I don't think that, uh, Shambhala society is possible within capitalism, um, just based off of the way that, you know, capitalism works, you know, off of profit. Um, and so that kind of automatically puts some people at the, at the bottom. Um, but yeah, as for our role, I think we need to, like I said, be doing all things at once, you know, meditation, view and, and action. Um, and so that's doing the personal work and that's also doing the work in, in the world. Um, so yeah, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I think it's, it's a lifelong journey. Well, I really appreciate Jack how in the midst of all that, I know how committed you are. Well, I mean, I think I know at least the flavor of how committed you are to those things. And I like at the same time that you have a lightness about you and you're not hateful about it. So oh, I really thanks. appreciate that about you. So thank you. Carry on the good work. Thank you. I had to work on that hateful part. <laughs> that part's hard. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, or do you want to share? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, sir. Uh, well, when you were talking about Christianity being used, I, I had to... Uh, First, the first thing it made me think of was Gibbon saying that uh, Constantine realized that he could use bishops to control the people more effectively than he could use troops. Right. However, if you read the history of Tibet, you'll find that Buddhism was used the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that any th any uh, any kind of uh, any philosophy can be used to uh, can be perverted. Right. And can be used uh, to. Uh, for for nefarious ends or or for and that i think is spiritual materialism right definitely that's, that's the, which lama likes to talk a lot about 
So I also though really appreciated your talk. And of course the things you're talking about are things that I struggled with my whole life too. Yeah. Uh, maybe not as effectively as you have, but uh, more nihilistically perhaps until I found Buddhism and even then uh, maybe more nihilistic than I would have liked to have been. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, thank you for your talk. I was looking forward to hearing you, and uh, you 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 came through. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Dirk. Yeah, and that is interesting about you know yeah it, any philosophy can be distorted, and um, and I I knew I had researched that a little bit before doing the talk, but the the difference that I felt that at least was different from my personal experience um, was how like how important it was for the Buddha to say, examine this, you know, make sure that you don't just, you know, believe this based off of faith. Um, so that was that kind of very different relation that um, that was helpful for me. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely true. But if you also, that's, we're kind of privileged in, in our current, our, we have a privileged place within this the the history of buddhism in a way totally yeah uh and uh culturally anyway uh if you watch like words of my perfect teacher by uh, uh zong zhao chense uh mm -hmm. or what do they call him chente norbu as the as a filmmaker i don't remember how it, how it's actually done there but when he he's traveling with some westerners students some students that are westerners and they go to bhutan uh and in bhutan the people are very obsequious toward him. Mm. And he tells the Westerners, you know, this is a problem. They won't challenge me. They won't ask me any questions. Yeah, so yeah. Took, and so I, I think uh, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to burst any bubbles or anything. Cause oh, I, no, I no. had, but I had the bubble. I had the bubble, I had the bubble burst. You know, I used to say, oh, well, Buddhism, you know, they, they don't, they never did this. Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. they, did it. they did it all. You know, they did everything. Totally. <laughs> and it's not because it's, so it's, it's not, it, it's, it's, uh, but, but we are privileged to have this pointed out to us that Buddha, see, we, we, we also come to a, we're coming into it in a way where the teachers say, oh, well, you know, look at this sutra, Buddha says not to do it. Whereas uh, they, they grew up in a culture where they never showed them that sutra. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. And, and then too, I, I, you know, saw that like for a long time, like Tibetans, you know, in Tibetan uh, culture, like uh, there were only like a certain, you know, set of, of things that, that people were taught. And part of that was like based on literacy, like, you know, most people were not literate. And so you only received like a certain amount of teachings and uh and yeah and 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 also like the relationship with hierarchy in the east in general is very different than over here and so there's kind of yes these different ways in which like buddhism based on both culture and history is yeah it's totally different it's all uh yeah dependently <laughs> arisen yeah our experience of it yeah thank you for bringing that up it's super important Karen, I see a hand. Um, yeah, Jack, thank you so much for your talk. I can tell I'm impressed because you've only been here a few years and you've done a lot of work um, in your person, you know, to to try to get at some really, really root. Um, issues and one of them being the guru relationship and hierarchy and things like that and how you fit your Christianity roots back you know in with um, your Buddhist path and things like that you know really really thoughtful deep thoughtful things and I'm impressed <laughs> so thank you because um, I think I sort of bumble along and and fall into things and then I think about them but um I had two comments, and one was um, about the guru relationship. Yes, it's hierarchical, and I had watched over the years um, Sangha members who were very, very devoted students of Lama Jempa and had been mm -hmm. with him for a long time, and they, that, you know, it's not, I think it's like kind of echoing what Susan was saying, that it's not a simple 
conventional hierarchical mm -hmm. relationship because it would only take one button that would get pushed on them by Lama and they were out of here. Mm. It's like they, one thing, it's like one thing would happen and it would push them right over the edge and they're like, I'm out of here. I'm not going to deal with you. Yeah. I'm, you know, I can't stand what you're saying to me and blah, 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 you know, and he would find that button in them, you know, after all those years. And so I think that we have to be very careful um, how we interpret what he's doing or saying to us. And, and again, that goes back to kind of what Susan was saying, that it's not simple um, or direct, in, at least my experience it has. And it's been oftentimes like a puzzle and a koan, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there trying to understand what he's saying to me. And if I were super reactive and, and easily got angry, I would have been gone too, you know? So, so I'm still here, thankfully. Um, <laughs> but it's not a, an easy, easy relationship. Um, yeah. So I wanted to say that about the guru related relationship, at least, in, you know, in my observation experience. Um, the other thing I wondered was, um, you know, there is a lot of hierarchy in, in the Buddhist, um, uh, say, you know, say lineage that we're in. There's a lot of hierarchies, um, you know, already established and things. How do you see um, the Sangha jewel in this hierarchical, you know, way, mm -hmm. or, or do you see it as hierarchical? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really examined that much. Um, maybe someone else could comment on that, but I kind of, I don't know, when I like do the prayer, like the refuge prayer, prayer um, you know, take refuge in the guru, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Those are kind of like, I don't know, again, it's kind of like this ecosystem. Like there's not necessarily one's higher than the other. Um, they're, they're all incredibly important to, to the path and to, yeah. Um, so I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't know if I would say that I put that within necessarily a hierarchy, those, those different pieces. Yeah. What do other people think? I, um, maybe other people have ideas on that. No? Well, I, I, I'll jump in. <laughs> I think Great. that there might be a, some, some conflict uh, of ideas between a hierarchy of an organization and a hierarchy of Buddhism as being, at, or a hierarchy of an organization, a hierarchy of the path. So what I mean is uh, that that an organization almost I, I don't see how an organization functions in the world as we know it, regardless of which culture it is, without a hierarchy. Somebody has to make decisions. Somebody has to take the actions. Somebody has there's a there are a lot of things that people need to take responsibility for. And I know Lama talks about when he was in the monastery, he would have to sit there and eat with them watching him because of that hierarchy. That's that's an organizational hierarchy. Certainly, um, I, but I'm kind of with you. I don't really, I don't really view the higher, that organizational hierarchy as something that reifies into the path itself. Oh, thanks, Dave. All right. Well, if nothing else, I guess we could say closing prayers. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jack. Um, before we do prayers and everyone sort of heads off to, I don't know, Mother's Day lunch or whatever, does anyone have any announcements? I have kind of a off the wall announcement a little bit. It's not about an event, um, but for I don't know how many members um, remember uh, Judy and Dick Kinter who were Sangha members at Lions Roar uh, in the past, um, Judy Kinter passed. Um, I found out in February um, at age of 93 with her daughter Janie taking care of her. Um, but Janie's trying to clean out her house and she has three kittens um, that they've been taking care of. And so she's looking for good homes for those. And she, you know, would, would trust, you know, Sangha members to be good um, stewards. So, <laughs> so if anyone, is willing to take one of the her kittens. Um, I think she'd greatly appreciate it. 
Um, should people contact you, Karen? Yes, you can contact me and I can I can tell I can be an interface with her um, if you want. Okay. Uh, and let's just double check. Uh, I don't see Lama's name on here. Uh, is Lama on here? Lama, if you're here, could you just close your ears or maybe um, not listen for a moment? There's a certain project that's going on that if you have not contributed to for Lama's birthday, could you make sure that you contribute to Lama's birthday? Um, there's an email address uh, for refuge members. Um, if you're confused by this and you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, you probably just didn't get the email because um, you're not a refuge member. Or if you are a refuge member, please email me or text me or Patty. Um, we're trying to get that going on. Um, the other thing is that we are still collecting um, mantras for Lamela's birthday, which is coming up like seven weeks away. Uh, so let's keep on top of that. I don't have a recent count. I know I have been remiss in not turning mine in. Um, that's you know, sort of my bad. I'm sure there's more of you that have not been turning yours in. Make sure you come uh, Monday night. So this coming Monday is Buddha Dharma study program, but the following Monday will be Manjushri again. Do Manjushri mantras on your own. Omar uh, Rapasanadi, collect those for Lama's long life. Um, you know, do the first part of the sadhana or not and just keep collecting them for Lama's birthday, uh, long life um, practice. Um, and we're gonna start setting a date pretty soon for those to be um, turned in by, uh, you know, I've been really busy with the AB project trying to get that done. So I've not been putting good updates in the roar about that, so I'm sorry. Um, but if you have questions, email info at lionsdharmacenter.org or me personally, if you have questions, um, and I can get you started on that or um, talk to Dirk. He's maybe a little bit more informed about the whole practice than I am. Um, anything else, any other questions or announcements that we can take right now? All right, well, Matthew, you ready? Thanks for your talk, Jack. I'm always really impressed with like how you can weave Dharma and personal experience together in a deep and cohesive way. It's a really good job. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful chenresig, tensin gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losong Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you all for coming. And uh, just a reminder, Lama Trimpa will be teaching with the Buddha Dharma study program tomorrow, uh, starting a little bit more in depth on the study of Swatantrika. And uh, we hope to see you then. Happy Mother's Day. And thank you very much, Jack, for a wonderful talk. We'll see you all Thanks later. Everybody. Right. Thank, thank you, Jack. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you for the talk. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, thank you. Matthew and Connor.
Yeah, close the talk. Bye. Thanks for coming, Serge. <laughs> and Cyril. Bye. Bye.